Hi, today I want to talk to you about a book called The Sleeper and the Spindle by Neil Gaiman. It's illustrated by Chris Riddle. I love his illustrations. It's not a new book, but it's one of my favourites. Look how beautiful it is. Some of you might already own it if you're a Neil Gaiman fan, but it's got this cover that's almost trans translucent yeah and uh, the back cover looks like this it's very cool I feel like I might read it for bed <laughs> and so at the back it says she was one of those forest witches driven to the margins a thousand years ago and a bad lot she cursed the babe at birth, such that when the girl was 18, she would prick her finger and sleep forever. So cool. Published by Bloomsbury. And it's... Find the cost. 12 Um, I can't remember when I bought it. So the, the blurb on the inside looks like this. I think this beautiful illustration when you press the open back. I don't know if you can see it. It's got mountain ranges and is that a sea? Um, there's a castle here. There's land. I love this. These kind of illustrations or drawings. You can see the tiny, tiny strokes. Anyway, so the blurb says it was the closest kingdom to the queen's as the crow flies, but not even the crows flew it. You may think you know the story. There's a young queen about to be married. There are some good news. Brave hardy dwarfs, a castle, shrouded in thorns, and a prince cursed by a witch. So rumour has it to sleep forever. Oh, sorry. And the princess, cursed by a witch. So rumour has it to sleep forever. But no one is waiting for a noble prince to appear on his trusty steed here. This fairy tale is spun with a thread of dark magic, which twists and turns and glints and shines. A queen might just prove herself a hero if a princess needs re needs rescuing. So, it's like the Sleeping Beauty, but there's a twist. Um. So yeah, it isn't like a typical, a prince comes to rescue her, it's more like she rescues herself and maybe this other princess too. <laughs> it's really beautiful. If I take this off you can see it better. So this is what it looks like without cover. It's beautiful. This is like the book from Princess that's a sleep cursed. This is the back of it. It looks very cool, the cover. These are, these are the dwarves. I love the contrast between this almost goldish, bronzy colour and the black and white illustrations. And this is the Queen's blanket, it's got these curls, it's really cool. I love it.
I'm gonna read a little bit of it to you, if you don't mind. Just the, the Queen woke early that morning. She's looking very gothic. <laughs> The Queen woke early that morning. A week from today, she said aloud, a week from today, I shall be married. It seemed both unlikely and extremely final. She wondered how she would feel to be a married woman. It would be the end of her life, she decided. If life was a time of choices, in a week from now, she would have no choices. She would reign over her people. She would have children. Perhaps she would die in childbirth. Perhaps. Perhaps she would die as an old woman, or a battle, but the path to her death, heartbeat by heartbeat, would be inevitable. She could hear the carpenters in the meadows beneath the castle, building the seats that would allow her people to watch her marry. Each hammer blow sounded like a heartbeat. I feel like I know exactly how she feels. <laughs> They're so good about a character that's not real, but so real. If you're ever like from a certain part of the world where if you're like, oh, you have no choice but to do this one particular thing, like getting married to a prince or whatever, or not technically a prince, but you know. Sometimes, like a certain age, you're like, oh, this person's 18, oh, we have to find, quote, unquote, a husband for her, unquote, unquote. They're going to have to get married and have children and eventually die. And <laughs> this is what exactly she's saying. So, I just really like her. Right, next, Let's see what happens. The three dwarves scrambled out of a hole in the side of the river bank and clambered up into the meadow. One, two, three. They climbed to the top of a granite outcrop. Granite? Granite or granite? I'm not sure. I'd say that. Outcrop stretched, kicked, jumped, and stretched themselves once more. Then they sprinted north towards the cluster of low buildings that made the village of Jif? I'm not sure if it's Jif or Gif, I'm feeling it's... I don't know. I'm going to carry on. And in particular to the village inn. The innkeeper was their friend. They had bought him a bottle of Cancelaire wine. Deep red, sweet and rich. And nothing like the sharp pale wines of those parts, as they always did. He would feed them and send them on their way and advise them. The innkeeper, just as huge as his barrels, beard as bushy and as orange as a fox's brush, was in the tap room. It was early in the morning, and on the dwarf's previous visits at the time of day, the room had been empty, but now there must have been Thirty people in that place, and not one of them looked happy. The dwarves who had expected to sidle into an empty tap room found all eyes upon them. Good Master Foxen, said the tallest dwarf to the innkeeper. Lads, said the innkeeper, who thought that the dwarves were boys for all they were four, perhaps five times his age. I know you travel the mountain passes. We need to get out of here. What's happening, said the smallest of the dwarves. Sleep, said the sot by the window. Plague, said the finely dressed woman. Doom, exclaimed the tinker, his saucepans rattling as he spoke. Doom is coming. We travel to the capital, said the tallest dwarf, who was no bigger than a child. 
Is there plague in the capital? It is not plague, said the sot by the window, whose beard was long and grey, and stained yellow with beer and wine. It is sleep, I tell you. How can sleep be a plague, said the smallest dwarf, who was beardless. A witch, said the sot, a bad fairy, corrected the fat-faced man. <laughs> she was an enchantress, as I heard it, interposed the pot girl. Whatever she was, said the sot, she was not invited to a birthing celebration. That's all tosh, said the tinker. She would have cursed the princess, whether he'd been invited. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. She would have cursed the princess, whether she'd been invited to the naming day party or not. She was, she was one of those forest witches, driven to the margins a thousand years ago, and a bad lot. She cursed the babe at birth, such that when the girl was eighteen, she would prick her finger and sleep forever. The fat-faced man wiped his forehead. He was sweating, although it was not warm. As I heard it, she was going to die, but another fairy, a good one this time, commuted her magical death sentence to one of sleep. Magical sleep, he added. So, said the sot. She pricked her finger on something or other and she fell asleep. And the other people in the castle, the lord and the lady, the butcher, baker, milkmaid, lady-in-waiting, all of them slept as she slept. None of them has aged a day since they closed their eyes. There were roses, said the pot girl, roses that grew up that grew up around the castle, and the forest grew thicker until it became impassable. This was, what, a hundred years ago? Sixty, perhaps eighty, said the woman, who had not spoken until now. I know because my aunt Letitia remembered happening, remembered it happening when she was a girl and she was no more than seventy when she died of the bloody flux, and that was only five years ago, come summer's end. I'm just gonna plug the charge in to my laptop. And brave men, continued the pot girl. Hey, and brave women too, they say, have attempted to travel to the forest of Ercare, to the castle at its heart, to wake the princess, and in waking her, to wake all the sleepers. But each and every one of those heroes ended their lives lost in the forest, murdered by bandits or impaled upon the thorns of the rose bushes that encircle the castle. Wake her how? said the middle-aged dwarf, hands still clutching his rock, for he thought in essentials. The usual method, said the pot girl, and she blushed, or so the tales have it. Right, said the tallest dwarf. So, boil the cold water, poured on the face, and a cry of, wakey, wakey. A kiss, said the sot, but nobody has ever got that close. They've been trying for sixty years or more, they say, the witch. Fairy, said the fat man. Enchantress, corrected the pod girl. Whatever she is, said the sot. She's still there. That's what they say. If you get that close, in... <laughs> if you make it through the roses, she'll be waiting for you. She's old as the hills, evil as a snake, full of malevolence and magic and death. Look at this illustration. This is in the, in, I think that might be an in Hebrew. The smallest dwarf tipped his head on one side, so there's a sleeping woman in a castle, and perhaps a witch or fairy there with her. Why is there also a plague? Well, for the last year, said the fat-faced man. Or maybe it was a fat-faced man. <laughs> <laughs> it started in the north, beyond the capital. I heard about it first from the travellers coming from Steed, which is near the forest of Ecare. People fell asleep in the town, said the pot girl. Lots of people fell asleep. 
and the tallest wolf, wolves sleep rarely, twice a year at most, for several weeks at a time, but he had slept enough in his long life that he did not regard sleep as anything special or unusual. They fall asleep whatever they come <laughs> gonna say that again. They fall asleep whatever they are doing and they do not wake up, said the Sot. Look at us. We fled the towns to come here. We have brothers and sisters, wives and children, sleeping now in their houses or cow sheds at their workbenches. All of us. It is moving faster and faster, said the thin red haired woman who had not spoken previously. Now it covers a mile, perhaps two miles each day. It will be here tomorrow, said the Sot, and he drained his flagon, gestured to the innkeeper to fill it once more. There is no way for us to go to escape it. Tomorrow everything here will be asleep. Some of us have resolved to escape into drunkenness before the sleep takes us. What is there to be afraid of in sleep, said the tallest wolf. It's just sleep. We all do it. Go and look, said the Sot. He threw back his head and drank as much as he could from his flagon. Then he looked back at them with eyes unfocused, as if they were surprised to still see them to still see them there. Well, go on. Go and look for yourselves. He swallowed the remaining drink, then he lay his head upon the table. They went and looked. This is the next illustration. I feel like maybe that's milk weight. <laughs> that's up to page eighteen. I'm going to leave that here for now. Love this book. Well, I hope you have a good night and I shall speak to you again next time. Bye.